2,000 years ago, uh, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. Europe was busy disemboweling heretics at the time. <laughs> Baghdad was open to all thought at the time, between A.D. 800 and 1100, around there. If you look at the advances that unfolded in that period, in that location, it includes uh, the, the, the invention of algebra. Algebra is an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. Two-thirds of the stars in the night sky that have names have Arabic names. How does that happen? Just what, Where did the naming rights come from? It came from the fact that at that time, huge advances in the Middle East, in Baghdad in particular, um, was uh, unfolded in engineering, mathematics, especially mathematics, astronomy, navigation, um, uh, physiology. And you say, well, why is that so? If you look at what was going on, they were open to all lines of thought. Jews, Muslims, Christians. There were doubters back then. Today we would call them atheists. They would all come around the table and share ideas. If you have some philosophy that's got holes in it, someone's going to find it. And you're going to challenge you on those ideas. And what happens is the conversation ratchets up. You discard what doesn't work and you keep what does. And when you do that, you make discoveries and you make discoveries rapidly. And at the time, that period drew to a close. If you read history books, they'll typically describe sort of the, the sacking of Baghdad. It was a bad time for the city. And they say, oh, it all came to an end. However, the Islamic culture rose at other times later. And in those other times, science and engineering discoveries were not a part of it. So he asked, what, why not? You got the cultural heritage. Why doesn't it show up again? And then you got to dig a little deeper from the sacking of Baghdad, and you find out there was a, a Muslim cleric, Al-Ghazali was his name, who was to Islam what St. Augustine was to Christianity. St. Augustine kind of laid out the rules for how to be a good Christian at the time. A lot of people were practicing it in their own way. He codified it. He was a religious scholar, figured it out according to his own read, told everybody how to behave. There's the book. You follow this, you're a good Christian. Al-Ghazali said, you follow this, you're a good Muslim. In that text included the assertion, which gained influence socially, but then politically, so then it had power of influence. In there was the assertion that mathematics and the manipulation of numbers was the work of the devil. The entire enterprise collapsed and never recovered. It has not recovered since. If you look at the number of Muslims who have won the Nobel Prize in the sciences, it's one. Number of Jews who have won the Nobel Prize, one-fourth of all Nobel Prizes in science have been won by Jews. How many Muslims in the world? 1.3 billion. How many Jews in the world? 15 million tops. So you look at what effect the culture of discovery and learning can have on what you discover about the natural world. It's extraordinary. Do you give people who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well, so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature, that's, that's what that is, and I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun, and in fact they can fall out of the sky. Right, because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. During one of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on Earth. To so even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages 
got the wrong answer. Right. So what happened was, when science discovers things, and you want to stay religious, or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is, you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you'd say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. And they're going to say, aha, those scientists have discovered God because God, dark matter, is what holds this universe together. So is that a question? <laughs> it's a statement. You know, you know they're going to so, say that. So the history of discovery, particularly cosmic discovery, but discovery in general, scientific discovery, is one where at any given moment there's a frontier. And there tends to be an urge for people, especially religious people, to assert that across that boundary into the unknown lies the handiwork of God. This shows up a lot. Newton even said it. He had his laws of gravity and motion, and he was explaining the moon and the planet. He was there. He doesn't mention God for any of that. And then he gets to the limits of what his equations can calculate. So I don't, can't quite figure this out. Maybe God steps in and makes it right every now and then. That's, that's where he invoked God. And and Ptolemy, he, he, he bet on the wrong horse, but he was a brilliant guy. He formulated the geocentric universe with Earth in the middle. This is where we got epicycles and all these, right. all this, the machinations of the heavens. There was still a mystery to him. He, he looked up and uttered the following words. I, when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies. These are the planets going through retrograde and back. The mysteries of the earth. When I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies. I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. What he did was invoke, he didn't invoke Zeus to account for the rock that he's standing on or the air he's breathing. It was this point of mystery and in gets invoked God. This over time has been described by philosophers as the God of the gaps. Mm -hmm. if if that's how you, if that's where you're going to put your God in this world, then God is an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. If that's how you're going to invoke God, if God is the mystery of the universe, these mysteries, we're, t we're tackling these mysteries one by one. If you're going to stay religious at the end of the conversation, God has to be more to you than just where science has yet to tread. So to the person who says, maybe dark matter is God, if the only reason why you're saying it's because it's a mystery, then get ready to have that undone. I think we put too much emphasis on what the meaning of the test is. I, I test people. It's a way to find out what you know. But don't then say, if you don't know this, therefore the rest of your life is screwed. No. No, because go find people who are successful in this world. Find, you know, talk show hosts and comedians and novelists and attorneys and go get the politicians. Put them in a room and say, how many here got straight A's throughout school? None of them are going to raise their hands. By the way, throw in inventors. Throw in all these people. None of them are going to raise their hand. Okay? So uh, Bill Gates dropped out of college. Uh, 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 D Michael Dell dropped out of college. Those people are not, the success of those people is not measured by how they performed on the exam that you wrote as professor. Because they're, they're thinking in ways that you have yet to think. Because they're inventing tomorrow. 
And the only way you can invent tomorrow is if you break out of the enclosure that the school system has provided for you by the exams written by people who are trained in another generation. You, Going to the you, moon? Know, you know what I joke about? No. I joke. I say, let me go visit China and, and whisper to the head of China. I go, Psst, can you leak a memo? that says you want to put military bases on Mars. <laughs> Just go ahead. Just, shh, don't tell anybody. Then uh, that memo shows up in the Pentagon. We will be on Mars in 10 months, I'm sure. <laughs> One month to design, build, and fund a spacecraft, and nine months to get there. We'll have astronauts. That's the, how motivated I think we would be, because that's how motivated we were back in the 1960s. Um, now, I, I don't want to go to Mars for military reasons. I think there's a strong economic reason one can make. What's for that? it, it's a little more subtle, and I think it takes slightly longer than the proverbial elevator ride that you have to save up for your member of Congress. Right. This takes maybe twice as long as an elevator ride. And I'm thinking, I voted, I voted for my representation in Congress. I, I want them to listen to me for longer than an elevator ride. So it's simple. You have, if you're if you're going into space in a big way, visiting asteroids, mining asteroids, tourist jaunts to the moon, uh, science on on Mars. Um, uh, you're doing all of these activities, there might be military activities, uh, all of this. To accomplish this will require advancing a space frontier. You'll be inventing, innovating, patents will be granted, and you'll have these discoveries writ large weekly, mm -hmm. if not daily, in your newspapers. Okay. And that, that, that infuses a culture of inquiry, a culture of exploration, a culture of innovation. And when you come from a culture of innovation, stuff gets solved, when you encounter okay, a problem, because you, your whole mindset is different. The point of the Large Hadron Collider was to embarrass America, to make us feel bad that we didn't have our collider built back in the 1980s when it was first funded. That's the whole point of the Large Hadron Collider. It's Europe saying, ah, gotcha this time. Now, apart from that ego bit, uh, it's to probe nature on levels of energy never before seen. And right now, it's hard. It's, practically impossible to discover a new law of physics on your tabletop. We've been there. We've done that. And almost the entire history of physics is go to the edges of your points of exploration and then take a step beyond that. You're bound to discover something new. It's like climbing the next mountain, crossing the next valley. So, the Large Hadron Collider, the energy inside that particle accelerator will exceed the energy of all accelerators that have ever been built before probing nature as never uh, previously imagined. What is the Higgs boson? Higgs boson, that's a particle proposed that you can think of it as a kind of a, it's like a, <laughs> think of it like molasses. Okay? Uh, well, okay, not molasses. Um, <laughs> It's a field through which all particles move, and the interaction of those particles with that field endows them with the mass that we measure for them. It is granting them the property of mass. We have yet to find this particle, but if we do... So mass is not explained presently. That's correct. We just measure... We don't know why we get fat. Turns <laughs> out dark energy was not as much of a game changer as you might think. Because that dis we already had a slot for it in Einstein's equations. We already had a placeholder. No one had ever measured it before. So we just assumed it was zero and got on with life. The moment it was discovered, we said, hey, now we can stick it in the equation. It's like, whoa. Its presence in the equation shows that there's this, for there's this pressure operating against the action of gravity, making the universe accelerate in its expansion. And that's extraordinary, because it means that they will come with these galaxies that Hubble discovered will, expand, will move away from us with such speed that they will disappear beyond our horizon, and the total known universe at that time will only be the Milky Way, restoring the state of mind of our universe that existed before 1920. <laughs> That's a spooky time. We would have to hand down the annals of cosmology from previous centuries to hear about the galaxies that were once in the night sky.